there's never been a better time to be building the future. Better connectivity technology that can scale to the entire planet, bringing billions of people online to a faster internet. Nothing in the world is advancing as fast as AI is today. And it's helping us build entirely new computing platforms. From VR headsets to AR glasses, these new platforms will help us share truly immersive experiences and reimagine what it's like to be together even when we're physically apart. Transforming how we work, play, and connect with the people we care most about. We build these new platforms and technologies with privacy and safety baked in from the very beginning. And it's all being invented here, inside the lab. Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us for Inside the Lab. We work on a lot of different technologies here at Meta, everything from virtual reality to designing our own data centers. And we are particularly focused on foundational technologies that can make entirely new things possible. And today, we're going to focus on perhaps the most important foundational technology of our time, artificial intelligence. We're gonna share some breakthroughs in our AI research and some of the problems that we need to solve as we build for the metaverse. The kinds of experiences that you'll have in the metaverse are beyond what is possible today. It's an immersive version of the internet. Instead of just looking at something on a screen, you're gonna actually feel like you're inside it or right there present with another person. And that's going to require advances across a whole range of areas, from new hardware devices to software for building and exploring worlds. And the key to unlocking a lot of these is advances in AI. So let's take a look at some of the challenges that we're working on. First, creating a new generation of assistants that will help us explore new worlds. Today, a lot of AI research is focused on understanding the physical world. But in the metaverse, we're going to need AI that is built around helping people navigate virtual worlds as well as our physical world with augmented reality. And because these worlds will be dynamic and always changing, AI is going to need to be able to understand context and learn in the way that humans do. And when we have glasses on our faces, that will be the first time that an AI system will be able to really see the world from our perspective, see what we see, hear what we hear, and more. So the ability and expectation that we have for AI systems is going to be much higher. Now, we are already using simpler machine learning systems to parse information for us today. Every time you get a recommendation or search for something or even take a photo on a phone, there is machine learning in the background. Computing is also becoming increasingly contextual. Instead of this static experience that's the same no matter where you are, the way that we use computers now adapts much more to what you're doing. And as devices have gotten better at understanding and anticipating what we want, they've also gotten more useful. Now, I expect that these trends will only increase in the future. The metaverse will consist of immersive worlds that you can create and interact with, with all the visual information that includes, like your position in 3D space, your, your body language, facial gestures, and so on. And this is all from your first person perspective. So you experience it and move through it as if you are really there. And all that adds up to a lot more input to be processed and a lot more content to be generated. So we're gonna need help navigating all of this efficiently. And the work that we do to build this is gonna pave the way for assistance that can move between virtual and physical worlds too. A key part of this effort is building better models for richer and deeper communication between people and AI. So today we are announcing Project Karaoke, which is a fully end-to-end -end neural model for building on-device assistance. It combines the approach behind BlenderBot with the latest in conversational AI to deliver better dialogue capabilities. And from there, to support true world creation and exploration, we need to advance well beyond the current state of the art for smart assistants. So we're working on two areas of AI research to make this possible. 
egocentric perception, which is about seeing worlds from a first-person perspective, and a whole new class of generative AI models that help you create anything that you can imagine. Now, here's an AI concept that we created called BuilderBot, which showcases this work. It enables you to describe a world, and then it will generate aspects of that world for you. So let's take a look at how this works. Hey, BuilderBot. First, let's start with the scene. Let's go to a park. Actually, let's go to the beach. Pretty good. Let's add some clouds. Huh, that's all AI generated. Actually, let's add some alto cumulus clouds. All right, and let's add an island over there. It's cool. How about we add some trees out here by the by the sand? Let's get a picnic blanket down here. Let's put up a table. Let's put a stereo. Let's get some drinks as well. Let's get the sound of some waves and seagulls. Does that speaker work? Let's play some tropical music. And let's add a hydrofoil. You gotta have a hydrofoil. You gotta teach me how to ride one in VR. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good, right? Now, as we advance this technology further, you're gonna be able to create nuanced worlds to explore and share experiences with others with just your voice. But there are a lot of challenges that we still need to solve to get there. One is developing true multimodal AI. Now, a lot of the early AI work has been focused on text. When you have a clearly defined syntax, a finite set of input words, and a lot of easily available training data, Predicting how a sentence might end can be relatively straightforward. But if you only have 10 or 20% of an image, predicting what the complete image will show is a lot more difficult. And figuring out what scene in a video will come next is another step change in complexity. So now imagine going beyond video to fully immersive experiences. What will it take for AI to accurately interpret and predict the kind of interactions that will happen in the metaverse, where people are moving between physical and virtual spaces and creating all kinds of new worlds? The main way that we have approached this is by working on self-supervised learning. Now, before SSL, most AI systems were trained with supervised learning. That means that you feed them lots of labeled data, say 100,000 images of cats, and explicitly tell them this is a cat, this isn't a cat, until they recognize some patterns. But Jan LeCun, our chief AI scientist, believed that this wasn't going to be enough to produce systems that can really understand the world. So we made a big bet on self-supervised learning. And the idea here is that you don't teach the AI any specific concepts, you just give it raw data, and ask it to predict the missing parts and it will learn abstract representations along the way. And this actually seems closer to how the brain learns. For example, you don't need to show a kid thousands of pictures of a cat for them to understand what a cat is. Now this has become the primary method of training AI to understand natural text. And it is now achieving state-of-the-art results for images, speech, and other types of data too. In fact, self-supervised learning now outperforms many other existing methods for images and video, even models that rely on millions of labels, which is a huge step forward. And while self-supervised learning is still developing, we think that it's going to be an important tool for the metaverse, because the complexity and diversity of the environments that people will experience in AR and VR will be too great to be captured with labeled datasets. Traditional computer vision techniques also aren't going to be enough to support that real sense of presence and interaction that will define the metaverse. So to help advance the state of the art in systems that can see and understand the world like we do, 
we recently brought together a global consortium of 13 universities and labs to work on Ego 4D, the largest ever egocentric data set with thousands of hours of first person video and benchmark tasks that everyone can use to research and build. So if you're working in this space, I highly encourage you to check this out. Now, the big goal here is to build a universal model that can incorporate knowledge across all modalities, text, speech, movement, position, body language, all the information that is captured through rich sensors. This will enable a vast scale of predictions, decisions, and generation, you know, the fundamental processes of how AI systems learn, as well as whole new architectures, training methods, and algorithms that can learn from a vast and diverse range of different inputs. Now, this is a major challenge and one of the critical steps on the path towards true AI. But before we get there, AI can help us solve an even more fundamental problem. And that is, even while access to technology is expanding globally, still nearly half the world can't access the internet in their own language. Now, this is partially uh, because most of the web is in just a handful of languages. You know, for example, there are millions of people who speak Fula in West and Central Africa, but their language is almost non-existent online. This is also because even the most advanced AI models used for translations today uh, were often trained in English. So a lot of services would translate something from a source language into English and then from English into the destination language, which adds some noise and imprecision to the translation. So we built an open source and AI model that can translate directly between 100 languages without having to go through English as an intermediate step. We're going to keep building technology that enables more people to access the internet in their language. And in the future, we hope to extend that to content and experiences in the metaverse too. This is going to be especially important when people begin teleporting across virtual worlds and experiencing things with people from different backgrounds. Now we have the chance to improve the internet and set a new standard where we can all communicate with one another, no matter what language we speak or where we come from. And if we get this right, this is just one example of how AI can help bring people together on a global scale. So to do this, today we are announcing two new projects. The first is No Language Left Behind, a new translation system that can learn every language, even if there isn't a lot of text available to learn from. We are creating a single model that can translate hundreds of languages with state-of-the-art results in most of the language pairs, everything from Asturian to Luganda to Urdu. Now, five years ago, we could translate across a dozen languages. Three years ago, uh, we were up to 30 languages. And this year, we are now aiming for hundreds of languages. The second project is even more ambitious, a universal speech translator. The goal here is instantaneous speech-to-speech -speech translation across all languages, even those that are mostly spoken. The ability to communicate with anyone in any language, you know, that's a superpower that people have dreamed of forever. And AI is going to deliver that within our lifetimes. Now you're gonna hear a lot more about these efforts from Angela, who's one of our AI researchers who's driving these breakthrough advancements in translation. But before I hand over to the team, I wanna say a few words about the way that we approach this work. Now, we're clearly focused on building technology to help people feel closer in all kinds of new ways. Right? That's our DNA as a company. Now, most tech companies focus on building new ways for you to interact with technology, but we build new technology so you can interact with the people you care about. One great thing about fundamental research is that advances made to help us achieve our vision also have wide ranging applications to enable completely new things in other areas as well. Now, one example of this is fast MRI. It's a project that uses our AI to cut the amount of data that an MRI scan requires by 4x. So if you've ever been in an MRI scanner, you know, you know that reducing the time spent in the scanner by 75% is a really big deal, you know, especially for kids who struggle to stay still for an hour. You know, it's rare to get you know, that magnitude of improvement by bringing an unrelated technology to an existing problem. 
it's kind of like, you know, if you invented a new kind of energy that was suddenly 75% more efficient and, you know, being able to use it to power all sorts of things. So I think that we're at a very exciting stage in this cycle. And you know, that definitely motivates us to try to enable this kind of innovation as much as possible. We're also driven by long-term goals. You know, we can do this metaverse work today because of the long-term investments that we started making in AI and virtual reality starting almost a decade ago. And the breakthroughs that we're now seeing in AI are thanks to long-term bets in self-supervised learning that we made in the early days of our research labs. And we're committed to building openly and responsibly. And as we make progress on this journey, we have the opportunity to build better, safer online environments for all of us. And that means creating AI technologies that deliver the highest levels of privacy and help prevent harm, like Crypt10, a framework for privacy-preserving machine learning that we built and open-sourced. And it also means engaging with human rights, civil rights, disability rights, and privacy experts, and building systems grounded in fairness, respect, and human dignity. And it means working openly and sharing progress, and also building the metaverse for everyone, so that people around the world have access to tools and technologies to realize their own vision for the future. You're going to hear more about our commitment to open science and responsible innovation shortly. But now, it's time for me to turn things over to Jerome and Joel. AI is one of the keys to the metaverse. I'm Jerome Pesanti, I manage the AI team here at Meta, and with my colleague, Joel Pinot, who directs our AI research labs, we will tell you how and why Meta cares about AI. The mission of Meta AI is to bring the world closer together by advancing AI. We advance AI in four different ways. First, we do AI research, coming up with the biggest AI breakthroughs by leveraging the power of open science and collaboration. Second, we use these breakthroughs to improve meta products. AI can help protect, connect, and empower users. Third, we build foundational technologies like PyTorch for the developer and research community that speeds the path from AI exploration to implementation. Finally, we ensure that our AI is built in a responsible way, an AI that is fair, inclusive, transparent, and safe for all users. What makes Meta AI unique is our ability to invest ahead of the curve. We can make long-term technology bets that have multi-year payoff while ensuring that when these bets come to fruition, they have an impact. This impact can be realized by improving the experience of the 3 billion users of Meta products or by open sourcing our AI systems so that the rest of the world benefits from them. One example of such bet is PyTorch. PyTorch started as a bottom-up research project by a handful of researchers. And thanks to an amazing community support, it became the leading framework for AI research. It's also used by Meta and by many other companies to deploy AI models in production. Another example is self-supervised learning. Our chief scientist, Yann LeCun, initiated this research program seven years ago. In the past, we taught our AI systems to perform singular tasks by giving them lots of human-generated examples of how to do the task successfully. This is what we call supervised learning, where the machine learns from direct human supervision. The challenge with this approach is that it's very task-dependent. It's not clear what the machine really understands beyond the narrow task, and it requires a lot of human labor that can introduce unwanted biases. Today, we are moving to self-supervised learning. If we look at how babies and children learn, we have two contrasting approaches. One where adult supervision is required to teach and instruct them what to do. But there is a second approach, a lot more prevalent, unsupervised, self-supervised, where kids learn by observing and interacting with the world on their own. With AI, we can try to do the same thing, learn from the data itself without any human supervision. For example, when dealing with language, an AI system can remove words from the input text and try to guess them back by inferring patterns in the surrounding words. As the AI systems get better at guessing, 
it also improves its understanding of the meaning and structure of language. That self-supervised techniques work so well that for almost all language tasks today, the best AI system have been pre-trained with it. Now, if we compare to the best systems from just five years ago that were trained on a specific language task with lots and lots of examples provided by humans, we can achieve the same performance today with self-supervised models that have never seen that task before. This is one of the biggest advantages of self-supervised models. They are task independent, so that a single model can be leveraged with some minimal fine tuning to perform several downstream tasks. The same models can help identify hate speech while also making your newsfeed and search results more relevant. Now, the exciting insight that I want to share with you today is that these self-supervised breakthroughs are no longer limited to language. In the past six months, researchers at MetaAI and in the rest of the industry have shown amazing results in understanding speech and images as well. For example, MetaAI researchers have managed to get a self-supervised technique that's almost as simple as the one I just described for language to work remarkably well for images. Take an image, divide it in small patches, remove 80% of these patches and ask the AI to reconstruct the full image. Not an easy task, even for humans. Removing so much of the images forces the AI to learn high level visual semantics to be able to reconstruct the images from so little. Combine that with the right network architecture called transformers, and you have a simple approach that's also very scalable and works surprisingly well. These methods are now becoming very competitive with supervised approaches that use orders of magnitude more human annotation. And we believe that as they did for language, they will be used to solve most tasks in computer vision in the future. And the same thing is happening for speech. Once again, meta AI researchers have shown that self-supervised techniques combined with a minimal amount of annotated data are competitive with traditional approaches using a lot more human supervision. As the same self-supervised algorithms give competitive results for all three modalities, they are paving the way to building a unified model able to perform complex tasks across all these modalities. Pushing the trend of having singular models perform broader sets of tasks to another level. But we are starting to create unified models that can understand multiple modalities at the same time, that can read lips while listening for better spectral cognition, or that can identify policy-breaking social media posts by analyzing all their components, text, image, audio, or video at the same time. But we won't stop there. We don't just want models that understand language and images and videos. We want AI models that understand the entire world around us. And with the advent on the metaverse, we have a unique challenge and a unique opportunity to make that happen. Joel is now joining us to tell us how we are going to do just that. Thanks, Jerome. The metaverse brings several new challenges. Most of the fast progress in AI of the last decade is deeply grounded in the internet. So it's not surprising that we've seen the most progress for data modalities such as speech, language, and vision. Those are the native modalities for the internet. In AR and VR though, the experience and the affordances are much bigger. So for example, movement from hands to faces to the whole body becomes a major vector for giving and receiving information. Now, this opens up some fascinating new opportunities and also requires some major progress in our AI models. Jerome shared the goal of building a unified model, but this isn't quite sufficient. We really need to make progress on building world models. A world model is a construct that AI researchers have talked about for years. The idea is to build a rich representation that can be used not just to make predictions, but also to roll forward the future and compare alternative choices of actions or interventions. Compared to a unified model, which is great to represent information, a world model is able to plan and to reason over that really long term. So as we move to building AI agents that can operate fluidly across true reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality, 
Our world models will need to be trained with a mix of static pre-recorded data, like the supervised models, but also a stream of interactive experiences. We don't know yet all the new methods and algorithms that we will develop in coming years, but we already know a few research directions are poised for big changes. Let me highlight today just a few of them which we are really excited about. Embodiment and robotics, creativity, responsibility. The reason we're looking at robotics is that it's a fantastic case where world models can make a major difference. Our focus here is to achieve what we can call unbounded robotics, robots that break out of the lab or highly constrained settings such as factories and are able to operate fluidly in the home, in the office, interacting with humans, space and objects as naturally as possible. And there are several steps to get there. If we observe how people learn, the experience is very different whether being taught a new skill and all they can do is observe. This is what most of our AI systems on the internet are doing right now, learning in a passive way, like a child sitting in front of a TV or computer. Of course, parents and psychologists have long known that learning is much faster, deeper, more transferable, when it's done actively through manipulating the world, trial and error and repeat. Now, one important step as we build robots that learn from rich interaction is that we need the robot itself physically to improve its ability to perceive the world through touch. To get there, we've been experimenting with new touch sensors. One sensor we created recently in partnership with researchers at CMU is Reskin, shown here in a blue glove. This is still a prototype, but quite exciting what we can do. Reskin has a deformable membrane with embedded magnetic particles. When it deforms in any way, the magnetic signal changes. We can measure these changes and use AI techniques to infer the contact location and amount of applied force. And Reskin actually uses self-supervised learning to auto-calibrate the sensor, making it more usable in all sorts of tasks. Another one of the new sensors we built in partnership with GelSight, an MIT spinoff, is the digit sensor. This sensor's surface consists of a deformable elastomer, and it's able to measure contact forces through changes in images recorded by a camera within the sensor. So compared with currently available commercial tactile sensors, Digits is a lot cheaper to manufacture, and it provides hundreds of thousands more contact points. Think of those contact points as the pixels of touch. This is remarkably fine-grained touching. Consistent with our approach on AI models, we've gone so far as to open source the plans for this one, making it accessible to research teams around the world. Once we start having the right sensors, we need to also build the AI models that will make the robot more intelligent. For example, hold objects robustly. This builds most closely on our work on unified model for the perception aspects, but we really need the world model here to plan how to pick up, manipulate, and place the objects without making a mess of things. As with most of our research work, we've built and released an open source library, in this case, the PyTouch library, that includes several functionalities such as detecting touch, slip, estimating the robot pause, and the object itself. This can all be included as part of a broader system with navigation and other robotics capabilities. One of the interesting challenges in all this work is to create some models that can operate both in the real world through physical robots, physical objects, but also in virtual worlds, allowing our avatars to pick up and manipulate objects in a realistic way and to ensure consistency from one to the other. To bridge the gap from reality to VR, our Habitat project explores developing a full photorealistic environment synthetically generated from thousands of scans of indoor environments with a physics-based engine for interactions. It's pretty sweet. Here we can train, test new algorithms for robot navigation and manipulation with realistic sensing and interaction 
with space and objects. It's a fantastic playground and a close cousin to the world builder you saw earlier in Mark's talk. While simulation is a great way to accelerate our research towards immersive environments, there's still a lot of work to do. In fact, there's still a big gap between simulation and the real world and much work to do to build some truly reliable world models. In particular, doing physics simulation in real time at all levels of resolution from fine contact with the objects to the full body motion is really very hard. But is it really necessary for our world models to be that precise all the time? That's an interesting question. In fact, the video gaming industry has often challenged this in a really interesting way. Many games totally sidestep the idea of realistic simulation by simply making interactions wildly different from what we know in the real world. One of the things I'm most excited to see in coming years is that same explosion of creativity, but fueled by the new capabilities in AI models. In this vein, let me share with you one short project, a particularly fun one recently out of our Meta AI research labs. Rather than trying to sense and recreate the real world, this one leans into the inner child we all have inside of us. It's a new approach to storytelling. And for people such as myself, whose artistic talent is best identified with the primitive period, this is just perfect. It starts from a simple drawing of a character and brings it to life in a short animated video sequence. Let's have a look. We start with a simple drawing of a character. It then uses our state-of-the-art object detection model, MaskR CNN, as implemented in the open source Detectron library to detect the figure from the background. We then use AlphaPose, a model trained for human pose detection, to identify key joints on the character. Once we have the mask, the joint predictions, we can move the character into various poses. We can select different motions, jumping, dancing, waving, to apply to the joints we detected. The results is really quite charming, and it's a great one to try with kids. This is just the beginning. You can expect to see a lot more as we explore new ways that AI models can enhance human creativity. But as we build all of this new research and technology, we have an opportunity to get this right or to get this wrong. With the metaverse, we can learn in a much more dynamic, interactive, creative way. Yet I'm keenly aware that the people who drive the research and who collect the data we feed into the AI models have a large influence on what products and experience we enable. So as we embark on a new journey of building AI for an embodied interacting metaverse, we really need to raise the bar on how we do it and what values we are going to promote in our design and our technology. So Jerome, before we close this, my question for you is, how are we going to raise this bar? Well, to raise the bar, Joel, we will need an unwavering commitment to create AI systems and technologies that follow the best practices in responsible AI. AI models that are fair, inclusive, transparent, and give our users more control while protecting their privacy. But these best practices are not easy to define because the problems involved are often complex societal problems that don't have clear and perfect answers that everybody agrees on. That's why it's important for us to be transparent about our work and share it with the broader responsible AI community to get their feedback and leverage their expertise. Today, I'll present three concrete examples of many AI doing just that. Last fall, we announced our approach to race data measurement. It's a very complicated problem. We believe that can be done by leveraging advances in privacy-preserving AI. So we published a proposal as a white paper to gather feedback and support from the community. We're also announcing today that the Responsible AI team, in collaboration with our Instagram equity team, plans to publish a prototype system card for Instagram feed ranking. 
This system card is inspired by model cards, a concept that was developed by AI researchers outside Meta. It's an interactive tool hosted on the Meta AI website that lets people understand how the AI behind feed ranking works. Finally, we're also excited to announce that Meta AI is open sourcing TorchRank, the recommendations library that powers many of our products. TorchRank demonstrates Meta's commitment to AI transparency and open science. It is available as a PyTorch library and provides common sparsity and parallelism primitives, enabling researchers to build the same state-of-the-art personalization that is used by Facebook Newsfeed and by Instagram Reels today. These are just a few concrete steps in our long, long journey towards more responsible AI. Now, earlier in my talk, I mentioned that I was most excited by our progress in applying self-supervised learning to computer vision. So I asked Peter Dollar, one of the research scientists involved in this research, to tell us all about it. Thank you, Jerome and Joel, for the nice introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our self-supervised vision systems. So our vision systems have had expanding capabilities over the last decade. When deep learning first started being very effective, the first thing we could really do with some degree of accuracy is predicting what's in an image. So being presented with an image and saying there's people, trees, buildings, and so on. And over the years, our vision systems gained more capabilities. So at some point, we started being able to, with some degree of accuracy, saying where objects are. We started being able to segment objects in an image. And over time, we sort of started being able to extract richer and more detailed information about the image. So to understand um, where we are going next and sort of how do we continue making this sort of very impressive progress uh, that we've been making as a community, it is worth slowing down and asking, how do we actually train our models? And so in computer vision, actually in, in, in a lot of areas of machine learning and deep learning, what you do is you present a system with input and output pairs. So you, for example, you present a system with an image and you want it to output a segmentation of that image. And then you train a model, which has billions of parameters in it. You tune those parameters, you tune those knobs until given inputs, they generate the desired outputs. So Training vision systems requires massive annotated data sets. And you really need to exponentially scale the number of images if you want to keep improving the accuracy of these vision systems. Now, as you can imagine, this becomes quite challenging, right? So here's an example of a human labeled image. And so what an annotator for segmentation, then what an annotator had to do is they had to go in and sort of outline the objects and, um, you know, in a sort of a detailed manner. And you can imagine, you know, for one image, this isn't really that big of a deal, but now you have to do this for tens, hundreds, thousands, and like I said, even millions or up to hundreds of millions if you want to really make these systems accurate. Now, clearly, this isn't scalable. Maybe you could do this for one or two applications, but you can't do this more generally for everything you want your vision systems to do. Um, and in addition, there's, there's sort of a, a, another more fundamental problem here, which is that, you know, whatever collection of images uh, and labels, they, they tend to have some bias in them. So for example, a lot of commonly used computer vision data sets in the community were collected, have a sort of a strong Western bias, were collected, for example, in the United States, labeled by annotators in the United States. Now, when you take these data sets and train vision systems, then they work well in the settings and with the labels that which they were trained for, right? But our world is so diverse and it's so hard to capture that diversity uh, in, in when you go and you label data sets because you're just inevitably going to miss something. And so the thing is we can and we do have diverse images from all across the world, right? People are uploading thousands, millions of photos every day from across the world. And we, we have the capability of learning vision systems that are much more inclusive if we could just learn from this collection of images and not have sort of the biases that creep in when we manually annotate those images. So what if we could only learn from the images themselves? And so again, let's go back to how these models were trained, right? We need 
to present the system with input output pairs. But now we only have the image itself. We don't have any annotations. So how do we do this, right? Like, how do we have an input and output if we have a single image? And there's a, a simple trick, a surprisingly simple trick. It's actually, it's not a new idea, but um, we've really been able to get it to work, which is you show a masked version of the image's input and the original image as the output. And so you basically just take the input image and just remove pixels from it, right? You just remove a certain amount of the information. Um, in fact, you remove the majority of the information. Um, and then you ask the model to predict the full scene and the full structure. And the, the great thing about this is now you can do this task with essentially an unlimited amount of images and, and you can use images from across the world. So the model really learns to predict uh, its surroundings. And why is this useful? So let's look at actual some examples. So here's an image. Um, this is like the kind of input that would be presented to the algorithm. And you could, looking at it, um, you may have some idea of what the content of this image is, right? And you can imagine kind of uh, an artist could go and kind of fill this in. And that's exactly what the algorithm is doing, right? So it, here's the reconstruction predicted by the algorithm. Um, it gets a lot of the structure uh, right, a lot of the semantics of the image. Now, it doesn't get all the details. Here's the original image. But to do this task, you know, it needs to have this sparse view of the image, and then it needs to know what it's looking at. So it really needs to kind of understand the semantics of images. Um, here's another example. Um, again, you may have some hint of what it is, but the algorithm has a really tough job. It really has to understand sort of the layout and complexity of like the, these objects interacting and the occlusions and kind of the structure and, and just a lot about the scene. Um, so here's the prediction of the algorithm and here's the ground truth. Again, it's not perfect, but it's really showing you that the algorithm is learning quite a bit. Um, it's actually also really interesting to look at um, what happens if we give very little, very few patches. So the examples I was showing to now are about 80% 80, 80 of the image mass. What happens when we mass around 95% of the image? So show like a very sparse set of patches. Actually, as humans, this task becomes really hard when you just look at these few patches. And now if you look at the predictions made by the algorithm, they no longer match the layout exactly of the input, but they're still capturing the high level semantics. They're still kind of understanding what is in the scene and um, you know they're kind of the algorithm interpolating it's guessing but it's really capturing sort of detailed uh, structural and semantic knowledge of the underlying visual world finally here's a little fun video of uh, what the model learns over time and so this is the prediction of the model sort of at the when it's seen a, a small number of image more images and then after seeing a lot of images and you can see that at the beginning the predictions are kind of fuzzy not really realistic and then over time uh, the algorithm is learning to really place uh, the semantic content uh, in the image um, and really learning kind of the structure of our visual world. Okay, so we can train a model in this way, but this model in and of itself isn't useful, right? We're not actually interested in predicting, given a mass version of an image, uh, predicting the, the full content. So how do we use such a model? So it's a two-step process. In uh, the first step, it's exactly what I was just describing. We just show it tons of images. Um, we show the unmasked, uh, or the, the masked, and then have it predict the mask. And from this, again, remember, these models have millions, billions of parameters. We tune the model, and the model at this stage is really learning sort of the general structure of the visual world. Then in the second stage, what we do is now we take, this is exactly what we've been doing in computer vision for a long time. We take the actual output that we're interested in. So in this case, the segmentation. And now we present the same model, which has already been trained um, you know, in this uh, self-supervised way. We now train it using our annotated data set. But this model already, before we start this training, before we tune the parameters, before we tune these knobs, the model already has a good understanding of the visual world. And so this allows a couple things. First of all, it removes some of the bias of the model because it's already learned from sort of general visual imagery. Right? So even if there's some bias in the labels, it's not so influenced by that. Second, um, it really allows us to train very big models and really reduces our reliance on the annotated data. Um, and third, it just works really well. As our model sizes increases, render really starts to shine, right? Because so when you have a small model, you typically have enough supervised data where you can kind of essentially learn the parameters of that small model well enough. But as you go to very big models, that's when self-supervised really gets an advantage, where um, really sort of the gap between supervised uh, training and then the, the self-supervised pre-training really starts to shine. And we can go back to those tasks I was showing at the beginning that we've been developing over the last decade um, in computer vision. And what happens is if we now train for those tasks, but we first pre-train this model to predict its surroundings, 
um, in a self-supervised way, then for all of these tasks, suddenly the, the, the improvement, the accuracy is massive. And in a lot of places where there's a little bit of data um, for the annotated task, um, the, the gains can be tremendous. So this is all very exciting, right? So this is really allowing us to improve in across all applications of computer vision, the quality of our models. But really it's also opening up sort of potentially new applications where imagine going to a setting um, where you don't have a lot of annotated data. Imagine exploring a new world um, or something closer to home, taking a look at medical imagery where um, you know we just don't even know quite maybe what the right things are to annotate, right? We can now imagine deploying our algorithm and having it learn just from the visual imagery in that new setting without requiring any human annotations. And this can enable entirely new applications. So coming back full circle, one of the things I was saying is that these models uh, trained in this unsupervised way using data, uh, much more diverse imagery can be much more fair. And so is that the case? So we've done a lot of analysis and while I won't present exact numbers, what we're seeing is that really on a lot of axes that we care about, we show there's a large reduction in the bias of these models. We see much better sort of generalization, a lot of, a lot of axes we care about. And this is so important. Um, the inclusivity of these models is just so much better given the very diverse nature of our visual world. And we want our models to be able to capture that. Next up is Angela Fenn, who's going to be sharing how we built inclusive technologies through language translation. Asusu. Busai de Bakuriyoros. Kalpana share kara. Jiliye sujuin. Across the globe, there are thousands of languages, making translation essential to inclusion. But today's translation technologies only work with languages that are widely spoken. In fact, more than 20% of the world's population is not covered by commercial translation technology. At Meta AI, we are building an advanced AI translation system for the 4 billion people who speak languages that are not as prevalent online. It's a new AI model that can learn from languages with few examples to train from. To translate any text, any speech, no matter the language, is a difficult challenge. Our mission also includes languages that are mostly oral, not written. The work requires new thinking and a lot of testing, and it needs to scale to the world. In a marketplace in Kenya, Vendors, artists, and customers from across Africa could negotiate easily in any of the many languages spoken there. An entrepreneur in China could learn from the same lectures making the rounds in other centers of technology. In the future, AR glasses could translate instantly for an engineer talking with local techs in rural India speaking any language, including the dozen spoken there. Imagine a world when translations of every language written and spoken include everyone. At Meta AI, we are working with partners that specialize in speech and audio to help make these advancements in translation technology. Together, we are getting closer to that world. Language is not just the sounds that we speak or the words that we write, but a fundamental connection of an individual to their family, their culture, and its history and traditions from generation to generation. Think about the music that you listen to, the holidays you might celebrate, or the food that you eat. Language serves as a foundation for our identity because it's one of the primary vehicles that we use to understand and then interact with the world around us. I grew up in Shanghai, where I live with my grandparents, and I grew up speaking Shanghainese. Shanghainese, it might not sound like a language. <laughs> I guess there's no city called French, uh, but actually around 10 million people speak it. And if you're like me and you grew up speaking Shanghainese, you actually also need to learn how to speak standard Mandarin, which we call Putonghua. And so when I left China to live with my parents in Canada, I had to learn English and Mandarin Chinese at the same time. 
being able to communicate with the people around you and understand what's happening, the fundamental feeling that you belong, that you know what's going on around you, it's often driven by language. For years growing up, I felt isolated because my Mandarin wasn't amazing and neither was my English. I experienced these feelings all over again when I moved to France recently to join Meta AI's research lab in Paris. This was actually one of the reasons why I decided to start working on translation in the first place. I used to work on something else because I could see the need every day around me for an easier way to connect with people and communicate, whether it was trying to mail something at the post office or buying a baguette. Immigrating to another country again as an adult reminded me that, wait, like why is English the default? It shouldn't have to be the default language that we use when we talk to people or when we use technology. You know, the language barrier, it exists around us already. From my personal experiences as an immigrant to perhaps wishing that the English dub of Squid Game was just a bit better. But it's critical that we make progress on eliminating this barrier, not only from an everyday living experience, but also through the technology that we use daily, because we want all future technology to be inclusive by default. Why does new technology have to be English centric? As we think about creating and building towards the metaverse collectively, we need to prioritize everyone being able to access new technology, which requires translation. For billions of people around the world, there is a barrier. We estimate that around 2 billion people speak a native language that doesn't have any translation system available in research or in a commercial product. That's about 25% of the world. And that doesn't even include all of the improvements we need to make for a whole category of languages that are so-called covered, but realistically need significant quality improvements to be used. It might feel simple to you. I guess if you're listening to this, you probably speak English, but in reality, only a handful of languages get to dominate the internet. And it's super easy to take the fact that technology almost always works in English for granted. This is also true for education and information in general online. Let's take this event, for example. It's about artificial intelligence. And for many people, they probably learn about artificial intelligence, machine learning, or maybe even computer science in general, not necessarily through a class in school. That could be a privilege but one of the amazing courses available online through Coursera, Udacity, maybe just on YouTube. But a lot of those classes are only available in English. What about everyone else that might want to access them? At Meta AI, we want to reimagine this. What if translation technology worked for every single person in the world? On behalf of everyone on the team, I'm privileged to talk today about our effort to create translations that are truly inclusive through two new efforts, no language left behind and universal speech translator. Our aim is to provide translations for both speech and text for the purpose of moving beyond English centrism and making a more inclusive world where English is no longer the default. There are thousands of languages spoken globally, but translation systems today, they only support around 100 languages. How can we move beyond this and create systems that really work for everyone? After all, people all over the world want to access technology, education, knowledge, economic opportunity, and more, not just those that speak majority languages. How is all of this technically possible? First, let me give you a little background on how translation systems work. Well, translation models today are neural network-based systems. They take an input, which can either be speech or text, and they convert it into a mathematical representation of that text or speech. And then a decoder neural network will read that representation and produce the translation. Now, the first step to creating more inclusive translations is to develop systems that can support multiple languages. Why is that a need and how can we do it? Well, a lot of work in translation has been focused on being able to translate just one specific direction, like going from Chinese to English. This is what we call a bilingual translation. Each translation direction will need to have its own specialized model. So I need to do Chinese to English, French to English, and so on and so forth. This doesn't scale to cover more languages. If I had to create a separate model for every single language direction we ever wanted to translate, we'd very quickly be counting tens of thousands of models to create. Such an endeavor just doesn't sound very feasible. Instead, we've focused on creating multilingual translation systems. What's the difference? Well, you've probably seen a professional translator translating between one language and another. That's what we call bilingual translation. Multilingual translation is that one translator being able to translate any language to any other 
rather than needing a bunch of different translators. These multilingual translations can take advantage of languages being related to each other to improve their performance. For example, romance languages as a group, they have a lot in common. And this similarity allows them to learn from each other when they're grouped together in a multilingual system. The main challenge, however, is how can you create one system that's just as good as so many different specialized systems? Just like my phone has limited storage for photos, well, models have limited capacity. So they might not be able to represent so many different languages. In our recent wins at two premier translation competitions, one for text and one for speech, we demonstrated that a multilingual system truly is better than bilingual systems. By increasing model size through things like mixture of experts, by producing more training data, and by scaling back translation, we demonstrated that multilingual translation is a really promising way forward. We have multilingual models that can support more languages, but now how can we push beyond English centrism? Many translation models today, when they translate from one language to another, are actually bottlenecked on training data going through English. For example, let's say I want to translate Chinese to French, something very relevant to myself. Uh, many existing systems actually translate Chinese to English and then translate English to French. Much of this is for a practical reason. Training data through English is just very prevalent. But our recent work called M2M, -M, it provides a true many-to-many -many direct translation capability. This cuts the English middleman, and it directly allows any language to be translated to any other. And this supports around 10,000 different language directions. This has a lot of important benefits. For example, it allows training data not through English to be effectively utilized. There's a lot of use cases around the world where this is just the case. Imagine, I don't know, Spanish to Portuguese or Thai to Lao. Those are translation directions that people use every day, but don't really rely on going through English. Further, we demonstrated that this direct translation actually produces better quality because going in and out of English being bottlenecked, it produces what we call cascading error. So imagine, let's say I make a mistake in my Chinese to English step. Well, then my English to French step, it can't really ever recover from it, which means that the error actually propagates and amplifies. This degrades translation quality. Now, how can we really expand to support hundreds of languages? Existing systems train on parallel data, examples of input text and output translation, and they need these in extremely large quantities. Only by seeing many examples of translations do models learn how to produce them. And machine learning is very, very data intensive. But the frontier that we're facing is one of data scarcity. For hundreds of languages around the world, there just aren't millions of example translations sitting around, even more so for speech translation. There are only a few languages with sufficient translation data. And after these, the amount of translation training data drastically drops off. To combat this problem of data scarcity, we've been creating and open sourcing large scale data sets for the research community. Some of this is what we call monolingual data, which means data in just one language. This is critical for things like large-scale self-supervised learning. For example, the dataset Vox Populi, it contains over 400,000 hours of speech data in 23 languages. Beyond this, we also focus on automatically creating parallel data. Let me explain this process. It works by first taking data on the web. It can be in both text and speech. This data is then encoded with a multilingual multimodal representation we call laser. Then we use large scale multilingual similarity search to identify sentences that have similar representation in the laser space, allowing us to automatically identify pairs of translations that can be used as training data. This means that we can automatically create examples of translation data without needing to have people hired to manually translate large data sets. This works for both text and speech. Our efforts in automatic data set creation already support over 100 languages and have been open sourced in data sets like CC Matrix. Recently, we've extended this to create over 1,400 hours of speech data as well. I started this talk by talking about my own native language, Shanghainese. It's a primarily spoken language, though. How do we include those as well? Most speech translation systems today use an intermediary, that of going through text. Instead of translating speech to speech, Systems actually convert speech to text, then do the text to text translation step, and then do a text to speech step. These models are so-called cascade models, but they're extremely dependent on text, 
meaning that they can't scale to languages that are primarily spoken, like Shanghainese. Instead, we focused on developing direct speech-to-speech -speech translation systems. And these could enable translations for primarily spoken languages. Being able to understand any content in any language, it could unlock new experiences for all of us. Imagine being able to read a book on release date or a child being able to interact with their grandparents, even if their grandparents speak a different language or taking any online class you want. This shouldn't be a privilege for those who happen to be born in a country where they speak English, but something that everyone should be able to do. We've been focusing on this mission and scaling it to high quality translations for hundreds of languages, focusing on both written and spoken languages. This is even more critical as we build new technologies and new ways for people to communicate seamlessly in the metaverse and beyond. I talked about my own personal experience today, but there are billions of people around the world experiencing this just like me. We're all deeply passionate about creating technology that can include every language and to work with communities all over the world together to make this possibility a reality. Next up, Al Boris is going to talk about how we're creating the assistance of tomorrow. Jack and her friends are planning a party, and it's not going well. What type of cuisine are you looking for? Actually, maybe this party needs to be formal wear. Sorry, I don't recognize formal wear as a cuisine type. Hmm, huh, this looks nice. Does this place rent out for private parties? Please repeat the name. Having trouble with the location. We're standing right in front of it. How would it know that? Formal wear, yes. Show me new dress arrivals. Here are the latest. Red? I haven't worn red in 10 years. Formal wear is the dress code, not the food type. Sorry, can you repeat the food type? Clearly, it's time for better virtual assistance. At Meta AI, we're excited to introduce Project Karaoke, breakthrough research that aims to make assistants more helpful and interactions with them more enjoyable. Project Karaoke is an AI model created for conversational agents. It works end-to-end, -end, combining the four existing models typically used by today's assistants into a single, more efficient and flexible model. Project Karaoke leverages years of advancement in natural language processing. Instead of scripted conversations delivered by most assistants today, Project Karaoke offers conversations that are deeply contextual and personalized, and the user is in charge of the conversation flow. This unified system is better built for natural conversations and could adapt to their normal but complicated flows. Are you looking for a caterer for a formal occasion? Yes. Thinking maybe Italian. Great. Here are a few Italian options. Wait, wait. French. Here is a curated list of French caterers. In the future, by having a versatile and nimble model, assistants using Project Karaoke could, for example, remember a favorite color or automatically update a reminder. Here are the newest dresses. Blue, my favorite. Can you add shared dress options to my three o'clock call with Jackie tomorrow? Done. Project Karaoke could keep the conversation going, even when it isn't crystal clear. Does this place rent out for private parties? Yes. Would you like me to check their availability? Check on Friday No, at... no, on Saturday. Oh, sorry. Uh, check the day after at 7. Checking availability for Saturday at 7 p.m. With the development of Project Karaoke, we are getting closer to assistance that could not only handle complicated tasks, but also understand our needs. I see the date of the party is your birthday. Can I help with the rest of the planning? Yes, please. Happy early birthday. At Meta, we are building Project Karaoke, a new and innovative AI model that could make conversations more personal, live past the moment, and on our terms. Imagine a future where you're wearing augmented reality glasses every day. And on these glasses, you would have an assistant to help you out in your daily life. Hi, I'm Al Bors and I'm supporting the team that's building these next generation assistants. Now, today, when we picture assistants, we picture dialogue and voice-based assistants. And this is a really limited view in augmented reality. 
let me paint a picture of what it could look like. Through AR glasses, your assistant could experience the world alongside you. It can see what you see from your first person perspective, hear what you hear, and most importantly, understand the context of the situations you are in, whether in the physical world or metaverse. And now that's a lot of information that you would like the assistant to understand by itself without having to explain it. For instance, if you're walking into your office at 9 a.m. or heading to dinner later that evening, or maybe going to work out in your gym, you would expect your assistant to be aware of these different environments and adapt to them. You would still interact with your assistant using your voice and also with gestures and expressions. And all that would be grounded both in the past and the current moment you are experiencing. At Meta AI, we are working on a system that could be personalized, embedded, embodied, and that could interact with you in a contextual, multimodal fashion. That way, your interactions are as frictionless as possible. Now, for this to work, people will need to build a level of trust with their assistants. For that, we're building our assistants with responsibility in mind. We will avoid surprising people. We plan to provide transparency and controls that matter. And we will aim at creating assistance that work for everyone. Project Karaoke, which I will discuss soon, is a platform we are working on to build such trusted contextual and multimodal assistance in the future. Today, it uses only voice, but in the future, we will augment it to handle so much more. With Project Karaoke, we hope to create the future assistance that will help you navigate the real and virtual words. Indeed, if you want, your assistant may even be able to follow you in the metaverse. But to continue our journey, let's for now focus on voice-only interactions. Assistant automation can be broken into three levels. The first category is level one assistant, which we call painful assistants. If you have ever called customer service and heard a litany of options, for hours, please press one, for directions, please press two, and so on and so on, you can totally relate to this level of frustration, especially if the reason you called isn't on the list of options. On the second level, we have mechanical assistant that you might be using in your home today. They're great with these single shot interactions, but they don't capture the deep context and allow for multi-turn conversations. Finally, on the third level, we have supercharged assistants, like what you saw in the opening video. They carry over the deep context, they personalize the experience, and they put the user in charge of the dialogue flow. There is a big question why, despite so much advancements in natural language understanding, like GPT-2, BERT, and Transformer Excel, we still don't have supercharged assistants. To answer this question, we have to tease apart the AI problems of understanding from interaction. Understanding is a single step machine learning problem to map an input to outputs, such as transcribing an audio, semantic parsing of a sentence, or mapping an image to its meaning. It is now widely accepted that the understanding problem should be solved using machine learning rather than pure engineering approaches. Now, interaction is a sequence of back and forth between the user and AI. For example, James may want to send a message to Nick that he will be five minutes late. When the AI prompts for his confirmation, James might be wondering about his ETA, which is 10 minutes. So in this case, James decides to update his ETA. While understanding is foundational for a good interaction, it just isn't sufficient. Moreover, interaction is often much more difficult than understanding because it involves sequential decision-making. But in practice, 
interaction is deemed easier and then realized mostly through engineering rather than machine learning approaches. Let's take a look at today's mechanical assistant pipeline in production. The voice input comes from the left. It first goes through understanding modules and then interaction modules. The resulting response is surfaced to the user on the right side. The blue modules are machine learning based, while the black ones are engineered. As you can see, the majority of the interaction components are blacked. In order to render the whole pipeline machine learning based, we combine the modules from natural language understanding all the way to the natural language generation into a single model. And that is the karaoke model. Now, if we eliminate the speech-related components on both sides, we are left with a single model that can speak both with the user on the left and an arbitrary set of services on the right side with a unified interface. Why? Because they both speak text. Now, let's see an example. James wants to send a message to his friend Patrick. To identify Patrick, the assistant selects the right service and generates the API call for it. Once it receives the response, it then implicitly confirms the name and asks for the message content. James wants to share his location with Patrick. And since all the context is present, the assistant creates the message draft and awaits for James' answer. Then the assistant calls the corresponding API and sends the message. Later, James gets curious about a food item while pointing at it. The assistant queries the visual search engine with the corresponding food image and location. And then it informs James that he's pointing at enchiladas verdes. Now, James is into a spicy food, so he asks for something with jalapenos. The assistant talks to the recommendation system and suggests the enchiladas al chipotle and leads its ingredients. Now, let's see what is under the hood of the project karaoke model. The core AI model is BART, a self-supervised language model. We fine-tune BART on our task data. On the first turn, when we pass James' request into our model and realize that we need to invoke a service through an API call. Once we receive the API response, we feed all of it into our model and decide to talk with James again. This process continues until the conversation is over. Of course, we use icons for illustrations, but they represent the textual information, which are all flattened and fed into our model. We are so excited to announce that this tech is rolling out across portal devices for setting reminders. If you have one, you might be using it already. We are thrilled about the potential of this tech, and this is only the beginning. We plan to augment the project karaoke model to handle multilingual and multimodal input and outputs, as we hope its single model architecture allows for a smoother upgrade process. Now, remember that in the beginning of the presentation, we zoomed into voice-only interactions. Now let's zoom out and see how Project Karaoke can fuel our metaverse engine in the future. In the future, we aim to integrate our Project Karaoke model with augmented and virtual reality devices, enabling even more immersive and multimodal interactions with AI assistants. How's my pozole coming? For example, your assistant could help you make your mom's delicious pozole, listing out ingredients as you need them and proactively guiding you through the recipe. Careful, Jose. You already added salt to this recipe. And I noticed you are running low, so I've put in an order for more. By combining augmented and virtual reality devices with our Project Karaoke model, we hope the future of conversational AI will be more personal and seamless. Here you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mom always liked this recipe spicy. What was the pepper she recommended? Your mom used habaneros pepper. Hmm. And don't forget to slice it really thinly like she does. Great job, Jose. Is it smelling like one your mum makes? It smells like the real thing. <laughs> oh. 
this is just a glimpse of assistant potential and why I wake up every day and work towards that feature. Next up, we have a conversation between Lex Friedman, Yasha Bengio, and Jan LeCun, who will be discussing our path to achieving human level intelligence. I am here with two of the greatest researchers minds in the history of artificial intelligence and computing. Jan LeCun, professor at NYU, chief AI scientist at Meta, and Turing Award winner. Also, Joshua Bengio, who's a professor at, I'm not going to say this with a French accent, University of Montreal, founder and scientific director of Mila, Quebec AI Institute, and also Turing Award winner. I thought it would be good to start by asking, what is your broad vision for our path, our journey towards human level intelligence? Maybe Yosha, you go first. Sure, thanks, uh, Lex. So I believe that we are still far from human level AI. And one of the ways to think about this gap is to look at um, problems that humans are really good at and that machines are not. And, and, and uh, one important such problem is the ability to generalize well on, on new tasks out of distribution or new settings. And if you look at how humans do it, they think they attend uh, uh, to the new situation, they reason around it, they take the time to think about the problem. And that's something that uh, we need to integrate into our AI systems. Um, and we can take inspiration from how brains do it. Um, there are uh, lots that we know about conscious processing that we can actually integrate into machine learning. We can think of this, the way I think about this is there are preferences or inductive biases or architectural um, uh, preferences that we find in the way the brain works that we can put in, for example, how knowledge is represented in a modular way um, with pieces of knowledge that are reusable, that can be composed on the fly to solve new tasks, how these pieces communicate with each other through a communication bottleneck, um, how the information uh, that's communicated is uh, going through uh, a uh, stochastic hard attention, and uh, how what is selected looks like our thoughts. Uh, and, and that the things that we think about uh, often have a causal interpretation that uh, is related to how we can act in the world, uh, how interventions in the environment are uh, explaining what we're seeing. Um, and, and all that can be done, I think, uh, with neural nets with uh, uh, maybe a somewhat different way of thinking about it. Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm working on and that, you know, I would love to tell you more about. Okay, you said a lot of interesting words there, uh, out of distribution, modular, uh, composing the knowledge pieces together, the stochastic hard attention. So there's causality also in that picture. We'd love to talk to you about all of these, but can you also just elaborate on what is out of distribution? Why is that a fundamental concept? So, so first of all, it's a, it's a practical problem in, in industry. You, you train a system with a data set uh, the data is being collected in a particular way, maybe in some country, and then you deploy the system in a different place, different time, and it, it kind of breaks down. So that's that's a symptom. And um, as an example, humans um, are actually pretty good at uh, a new setting. Like if you if you learned to drive in uh, North America and then you rent a car in London, it's the first time you drive on the left side of the road. It's a challenge, but you can survive it and you pay attention to what is going on. You're generalizing out of distribution. You're adapting also out of distribution. So out of distribution is you learn uh, in, in one city and you have to be able to transfer that and operate successfully in another city. And that is a fundamental aspect of human level intelligence. Humans are able to somehow do this kind of thing, take a leap into the unknown and well, it's not completely unknown. So the reason we are able to drive on the left side in London, if you you know drove all your life in North America, is because 
there are lots of things in common. Like the laws of physics are the same. People are the same. It's just like this one little thing that changed, which is a, you know, one traffic rule. And our brain somehow has structured information so as to separate these pieces of knowledge so that we can now just change one thing, which is this rule, and, and somehow uh, infer our way around it uh, and then uh, gradually uh, retrain our habits so that we can do well in London as well. So Jan, uh, Yosha laid uh, some cool ideas out on the table, inductive biases, uh, generalizing out of distribution. What are your thoughts? What's your vision for human level, uh, for our journey towards human level intelligence? Okay, so Joshua uh, focused on a list of uh, problems that we need to solve. And uh, I agree with the list that, that, that he mentions, but I'm, not fo I'm more focused on, on solutions actually. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but first of all, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can clearly see that uh, humans and animals can learn new skills or acquire new, new, new knowledge much, much faster than any of the uh, artificial systems that, um, that, that we've built so far, that we have conceived. Um, they can learn with fewer trials if it's a kind of a new skill. They can, you know, they can learn with uh, fewer examples if it, if it, you know, consists in learning new concepts. So, um, what kind of learning do humans and animals use that we are not currently be, being able to reproduce in machines? That's the big question I'm asking myself. Um, what is it that uh, allows a, you know, a teenager to learn to drive a car in about 15 or 20 hours of uh, practice? Whereas you know, even with sort of million of hours of training of, uh, in virtual environments, we can get uh, cars to learn to drive themselves to the same degree of reliability. So. Um, so there is something that we're missing in a sort of current um, uh, approaches to AI. Um, and I think what's missing is the ability of humans and animals to learn uh, how the world works, to learn uh, what I call world models. I mean, a lot of people are calling, the, uh, are calling it this way. So the, 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 the fact that, um, as Joshua mentioned, you know, the laws of physics don't change if you move from North America to, uh, to Britain. Uh, and so, you know, when you turn the wheel to to the to the right, the car is still going to veer to the right, and and the basic physics of momentum and everything is is still going to be the same. This is what allows the the teenager learning to drive, to not have to try to run off a cliff to see what happens, uh, whereas uh, a sort of naive tabula rasa uh, AI system will have to actually run off the cliff to figure out that it's a bad idea, and probably do it a few thousand times before it uh, realizes how not to do it. So. Um, so that's 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 what we're missing. How, how do we get um, machines to learn world models, to learn uh, how the world works, mostly by observation, to accumulate the enormous amounts of background knowledge that uh, humans, you know, baby humans, uh, accumulate in the first few weeks and months of life, uh, where they figured out like very basic things about the world. The world is three-dimensional. There are objects that are different from things in the background, and there are objects that are static, you know, inanimate, um, objects that seem to move, uh, objects whose trajectory is predictable, um, you know, they fall when they're uh, not supported, things like that. So, you know, we learn all those things in the first few months of life. That, in my opinion, is, is what constitutes the basis for what we call common sense, perhaps. Um, and uh, we don't know yet how to do this with machine, but we have a few ideas like self-supervised learning and, and things of that type. Actually, Jan, I'm very focused on solutions too. I'm sure um, you are. I know you are. And and some of the things I talked about were sort of the uh, early steps in thinking about the world model you were talking about. Because I agree, it's it's very very central. But one of the things I believe is that this world model needs to be structured. So what does it mean, structure? It means uh, just like in the brain that the knowledge is uh, somehow decomposed into pieces that are as independent. Uh, from each other as possible. And there are good reasons why you want to do that from a theoretical perspective that would help out of distribution. And I'm currently thinking of new algorithms that are precisely allow to do these kind of things. So so for you, Yosha, modularity is fundamental. Let me ask, let me zoom out a little bit. So for constructing these kinds of world models for uh, reasoning out of distribution, can you do that with one, one very big differentiable neural network? And if so, what properties does this neural network 
uh, have. Maybe uh, Jan, take that one. Well, uh, the I guess the two big questions: What is the paradigm of learning that you have to use? The second one is what, what's the architecture of the system that that will will learn this? Uh, there's no question in my mind that that system will have. Uh, very much in common with what we currently call deep learning. So it might be some giant big neural net that we train with gradient-based type uh, algorithm because that's pretty much the only weapon we have at the moment for this kind of problem, that at least the only one that is efficient enough. Um, so, so deep learning is part of the solution, there's no question. Now in terms of concept for sort of learning paradigms, uh, I've been sort of a big advocate of self-supervised learning. And self-supervised learning is nothing more than this idea that um, uh, you know, you, you have a piece of the input, some of which is currently observable, and then there is another piece that is not currently observable, maybe because it's covered by, uh, you know, uh, an object or something, if it's, if it's vision, or perhaps because uh, it's the future and you have to wait until, uh, for a bit, in, you know, until you can see the future. So training a world model consists in looking at the past and the present and maybe remembering what the condition in the world uh, is, and then waiting for things to happen and then training your one model to predict what, what just happened. If you just took an action, of course, now your one model knows how to predict the next state of the world from the previous state of the world and the action you took. So you have one of those causal models that uh, Joshua was, uh, was, was referring to. Um, and and the, the big question is, is, uh, is how you do that. And, and the, the, the technical question under this is how you deal with the uncertainty in the prediction uh, and how you deal with the fact that the, the, the level of abstraction of the representation of the world that you need to construct while doing so uh, needs to be, you know, high. It need to be a, needs to be kind of a high level of abstraction. See, so if, um, you know, if I want to predict what's going to happen next, uh, uh, you know, what you are going to do next, um, I, I know maybe you might, you know, say a word or move your mouth in a particular way, move your head in a particular way, but you're not going to suddenly disappear. Uh, you're not going to kind of, you know, teleport uh, from one one place of the, the video to another, just 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 like that. And your your face is not going to morph into something else, right? So there are like constraints in the physical world that, you know, I I know uh, prevent those things from happening. And that's basically the that's the basis of uh, of common sense, and uh, which you know. Common sense is a collection of models, of world models. Um, so so that, what kind of self-supervised learning might allow us to do this? Um, there's a few ideas about this. It's probably not the kind of uh, self-supervised learning that has been very popular uh, until now, where you, you're directly trying to predict what's going to happen next in the, the, in the space of uh, observations. So you want to do video prediction, for example. Uh, you see a, a piece of a video and you train a system to predict the next uh, frames in the video, it's a very, very hard problem because you have to you know, reconstruct all the details of the pixels and everything. And uh, it's very likely to me that, uh, in my opinion, that the type of architecture we need to build are things where the prediction doesn't take place uh, necessarily at that level, but takes place in sort of a high level of, of abstraction where the useful information is present and the error, irrelevant stuff uh, isn't. But the abstraction, is stored within the same system. It's not like somehow separate. This idea of modularity that Yosha is talking about is really interesting. So maybe Yosha, you could you could talk about what is this big giant thing that achieves human level intelligence look like? Is it differentiable? Is there, is there some discrete components? What are these different? Uh, is there a fundamental modularity or hierarchy that forms these uh, high level abstractions? What do you think? So if we again look at a uh, human uh, condition, um, the, the thoughts that we have involve a discrete choice among different alternatives. So if you see the Necker cube one way, you don't see it the other way. It's not a mush of different options. And so there, there is, you know, that probably corresponds to a discrete uh, attention. Now, uh, that makes it a little bit more difficult to do end-to-end -end learning. I think we can get around that, and, and I have many uh, uh, solutions in my pocket for this. Uh, but then locally in each module, so that's the communication between modules. It, it involves discrete decisions. But the um, internal to each module could, you know, could be done fully end-to-end, -end, I think. Um, so it could be a mix of both. Um, 
I mean, what's I missing the, in the, the, oh. the, the modularity question is an interesting one. So, uh, you know, certainly the world model uh, may have multiple modules, but, uh, you know, uh, you don't need multiple modules really for the hierarchy, not any more than you have in a multi layer neural net where there is a hierarchy already of uh, uh, abstract concepts. Uh, but, you, but you need other modules than just a world model, right? You need, uh, first, you need a, a module that configures the world model for the situation at hand. Uh, if you have only one world model engine, it needs to be configured for whatever task you are accomplishing. Uh, you need some sort of uh, cost module that um, the system basically, you know, the behavior of the system basically is all directed towards optimizing that cost. Uh, and part of that cost can be sort of hardwired cost things that you know, compute pain and pleasure and things like this. And then uh, uh, cost, uh, modules that are learned, basically that define sub goals, uh, perhaps. And then you, you, know, you need to have short-term memory to kind of maintain an estimate of the state of the world in the, in the brain of uh, mammals is, is the hippocampus, a vertebrate even. Um, and then you need some other module that figures out like what sequence of actions should I do to optimize my cost given my word model. Uh, you, know, you also need perception. So all of those are modules. Uh, I don't think the structure is, uh, you know, are very necessarily very different from each other, but but there is some sort of macro architecture of an autonomous intelligence system that you need to devise. So, so I, I, I disagree on one point here. Um, I, I think there may be a good reason why this uh, modularity, which is really the story behind the global workspace theory uh, from Bars, uh, can help to make the right abstractions emerge and. One way to think about it is uh, like the way we program, uh, we, where we use encapsulation. So we try to divide code into little independent pieces, as independent as possible. Of course, not completely independent because you, these pieces need to communicate through the arguments and, and return values. But what information do you want to put in the, if you constrain the bottleneck of the communication, is going to be the most abstract aspects that have to do with uh, you know, what the minimal information that's needed for these experts to collaborate together. Yes. And so um, I, I think the details of, for example, how a particular function is computed is it can be hidden in, inside each module, but uh, the uh, uh, communication bottleneck helps to force the emergence of these uh, abstract concepts, which is what they exchange with each other. So oh, the yeah, constraints totally are... Totally agree with that. The constraints are a feature, not a bug. So they force the abstraction. Yes. In the yes. Communication. Yeah, and, and and it's interesting because to to consider like why would evolution put such a bottleneck in our brains and in probably many other animals, because like working memory of uh, seven, five or seven items, it seems so small. In fact, other animals have a larger one, uh, and the brain is huge. So it, it you know there must be evolutionary pressure that has verged to this constraint. Uh, Yosha and Jan, you also talk about the source of consciousness in uh, in the human mind and how it might be useful for human level intelligence in the machine. And you talk about the constraints there that it somehow might emerge from the constraints um, of the of the architecture. Can you maybe talk about why this is something you think about and what is the source of consciousness? Easy questions today. What is the source of consciousness in the human mind and how that might be useful for our AI systems? Yosha? Sure. Uh, well, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> hard. It's a, okay. So first of all, it's a very much open question. Uh, and lots of people would like to understand consciousness and there are a number of competing theories about it. Now, if I, I have to make uh, a bet about you know, something that uh, fits my understanding and the data I know about from, from the brain and from machine learning, um, I, I would say that the, this, the, the global workspace theory, which is, is the one that proposed this uh, bottleneck idea, is one important element. But there's probably something missing from there. And, and again, looking at the neuroscience theories, um, there is another um, a theory that's uh, a bit more recent that I think could help with the, the um, illusion of consciousness. So the impression that there is uh, a, 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 a something different in the, the fact that we are experiencing consciously something and it's not just uh, computation. It is all computation. So it clearly is an illusion. So the uh, Grajano's theory of um, 
attention schema theory, is this what it's called, is, is saying there's a, a, a another module besides the, the modules we'll be talking about um, that is a, a, a little model of uh, attention of where are we going to put our attention next? And it's able to plan that. And, and it's like a mini model of the rest of Cortex, right? And so, because it has this, so it's a little bit like a uh, you know a homunculus, right? It, it, it's not a very good model of what we actually do, but it it's good enough to help plan the proper sequence of attention uh, choices. And so that might give rise to that uh, a Cartesian duality, which uh, we seem to feel, but but is is probably just a, a, a side effect of this architecture. Yeah, and do you have thoughts on uh, on the consciousness or maybe attention and its the, this kind of its role in this kind of uh, system? I think it goes way beyond attention, but you know, I have a bit of a kind of a strange opinion about about consciousness, which is actually not disconnected from what what Yoshua just said. Um, so I think you know, I I, I mentioned earlier that um, you know most of our intelligence uh, comes from our ability to predict, and that comes from our world model. But of course, when we attend to a task. The world model that we're using is the world model that is specific to the task at hand. And that has to be, uh, because the world model is a really complex thing, we only have one in our head. We, can, we have one engine that allows us to you know, predict what's going to happen in a situation, which is why we can only attend to one task at any one time, uh, at least consciously. And so that suggests that we only have one world model and it's being configured by something okay, that does executive decision, uh, this little um, uh, homunculus-like a system that Yoshua was mentioning that essentially um, is above that and configures all the other modules for the, the task at hand. And that gives us the illusion of, uh, of consciousness, right? Because there is this sort of, you know, meta observer that, that configures the rest of the brain for, for to attend to a particular task. And it doesn't uh, just configure our world model, it configures our perception system too, right? Uh, you ask people to, uh, uh, attend to uh, you know particular things going on in the scene, and they they become blind to everything else that happens. So, um, uh, so so I think uh, that configurator module, I think that sort of configures the other ones to do a particular thing. Maybe is the thing that gives us the illusion of uh, consciousness. And so the interesting uh, aspect of this is that consciousness would not be then a consequence of the fact that we are smart, but a consequence of the fact that our brain size is limited. If we had an infinite sized brain, then we could have dedicated world model for all the situation we can encounter. And we wouldn't need a configurator to um, you know, configure our model to the task at hand. So, you know, it's- Consciousness. Yep. So they, they just want to comment on the uh, uh, attention blindness experiments that, that Jan talked about. There's also a related kind of experiment that helps to understand uh, that's the um, uh, blind side. So in, in the kind of experiment that Jan talked about where you, you focus on something and you don't see things that are actually here, uh, actually part of your brain does see them the, at, at the unconscious level and you can actually act uh, accordingly. So um, th that's, that's something weird. Like uh, uh, some people have that because of neurological problems that they, they, they say they don't see anything but they actually will do the right thing to pick up the glass and so on. Okay, let me ask a big uh, question for you. You know, looking back, you're one of the most important, one of the seminal researchers in the field of artificial intelligence. So you can look at the big scope. Uh, think back to the 1990s. Uh, how have you changed at, in terms of your view of what's required to achieve intelligence? Maybe your fashion choices and so on too, uh, music choices. Uh, but just as an AI uh, visionary, how is your view of, of what's required to achieve human level intelligence changed? And how does that inform you about the coming decades of the evolution of the field of AI? Maybe Jan, can, can you go first? So the way I tend to operate is that, uh, you know, I, I may have in the back of my mind a very long-term goal, you know, making machines more intelligent, understanding human intelligence and uh, animal intelligence. And then I try to work my way back. Um, so, you know, we don't know any intelligent entity that doesn't, that doesn't learn. So learning must be a very important part of intelligence, right? So how do we do learning? Um, 
Now learning, you know, involves learning to represent things. So it has to be hierarchical, abstract. Um, how can we do this? You know, learning is always formulated in terms of optimization. So we need some way uh, of, uh, you know, uh, optimizing through gradient descent because that's the most efficient thing we, we know how to do. Uh, hierarchical architectures. And that's what led to multi-layer neural nets and deep learning and backpropagation. Now working our way back. Now, now we need to do to be able to do perception because an intelligent system needs to be able to estimate the state of the world. And that's what perception is about. So let's build a perception system to see if that idea of hierarchy works, right? And that's convolutional nets. Okay, so now we're in the 80s and 90s, okay? Um, and now working our way back. So now we know how to do perception, admittedly in a supervised manner. Um, and you know, we can we can see that uh, uh, humans and animals do not learn in a supervised manner. They learn to represent the world by observation, as I was mentioning earlier. So a bunch of us, um, after having kind of not solved, but you know, sort of passed the stage of supervised learning, got interested into unsupervised learning, or now something I call self-supervised learning. Uh, and Yoshua and I, and you know, Jeff Hinton, basically got together and and sort of discussed this um, uh, in the early 2000s. So, you know, that's 20 years ago, um, where we, you know, formed a little group where people were sort of interesting in, in uh, uh, similar problems. On the way to trying to figure out how to train large neural nets in an unsupervised manner, we figured out how to train large neural nets in a supervised manner using GPUs. And that's what took off. But really, that's not what we were after. We were after unsupervised learning. And so after the first few years of you know, exploiting the fact that we can use supervised learning with very large neural nets and GPU, now we are back to the original problem. You know, how do humans and animals uh, uh, learn in a self-supervised, unsupervised manner? Um, and and, and you know, when the reason we need this is not just to learn representations of the world for perception, but also to learn predictive world model for planning, uh, reasoning, uh, et cetera, right? And so that's that's the progression, right? So you have a long-term goal, and then you kind of figure out like what is the first problem I need to solve if I want to move forward towards that goal. And the last, uh, at least my last 35 years, basically have been sort of uh, uh, along along those lines, um, if not more than 35, actually. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun, uh, Yosha. How have your uh, view of AI changed? Uh, what's required to achieve human-level intelligence, and maybe also what do you think the next few years and decades look like in terms of the growth and development of the field? Um, I mean, what has changed mostly is have matured and, and I know a lot more stuff, uh, which helps me supervise <laughs> students better. Uh, I think if I remember the way I was thinking in the, in the 90s, say, uh, which is actually when Jan and I started to collaborate, um, I was very focused on a very small part of the field. And, um, and now it's like lots of different aspects of research in AI and machine learning, and, then, and not just machine learning, but you know, even like classical AI, suddenly seem to fit better in the bigger picture, including, you know, and also knowledge about neuroscience, coxi, and, and other things. So uh, I, I feel much better equipped to do what Jan was also talking about, and that is, well, reason uh, my way into where we need to go next in order to capture all of these constraints coming from what we know about the brains and what we know from our experience in machine learning and AI broadly. Is, is there, just sorry to interrupt, is there advice, because you mentioned grad students, is there advice you can give to said grad students if they dream about pushing the field forward about what they should work on? What are the exciting, difficult um, problems that might crack open this, uh, this problem of human level intelligence? Well, that's what I'm working on. Uh, what would you tell I mean, to, yes, I mean, so what, read what, my what, latest what advice paper on would you give? That's what I would tell <laughs> advice them. one is read the paper, yes, yes. But, uh, um, but, yeah. but, but, but in general, I would say more on the methodological side, try to understand what you're doing. So I think, unfortunately, uh, a lot of students, uh, because it's easier, will just use the concepts that are around in our community and do plug and play and uh, do engineering with that, which can be very useful. 
But I think if you want to push the, the, the frontier here, you really need to ask the why questions all the time and, and keep asking uh, rather than try to beat the benchmarks. I mean, of course, but that's going to come as a side effect, right? So focus on understanding and the science and the why questions. And that's like the key to science in general. Yeah, and do you have, do you have advice for grad students what, yeah. uh, and how to take on this problem? And these are two things that have changed in the last 90, you know, the last uh, 30 years or so or, or more. Um, it used to be, you know, in the early 90s, late 80s, when, you, you know, you're sure were working on neural nets already, there was a community, you know, that was sort of interested in kind of similar problems that, that we could talk to. And then that community disappeared in the mid 90s. And we were in a combination of fortunate and unfortunate situation. Unfortunate because few people were interested in what we were interested in, but, but fortunate because we could do things that nobody else could do, and we were the only people in the world who, to do it. Um, whereas now, um, uh, which is a very good thing, is an enormous amount of people interested in the same stuff that we are interested in, and they know more about our own stuff than we do. Okay, so um, there's a lot of collectively at least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's like you know uh, thousands of uh, you know students and researchers who know more about the latest greatest details of convolutional nets than I do, uh, and it's fantastic. Like you know, I, I really love that. So uh, that means. Uh, if I want to contribute, I need to move on, right, to kind of the the, the next step. Um, and so, what for for students? Like, there are many different ways uh, a researcher, a young researcher, particularly uh, in AI, can contribute. And and some of them are, uh, you know, applications of existing methods to new problems. And the, and you know, the current today's world doesn't like uh, any supply of problems. Um, so so that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, devising new methods that you know, improve benchmarks or, or sort of known uh, applications like, like you know, computer vision, translation, natural language understanding, this kind of stuff. Um, then there is sort of devising new uh, uh, principles or, or algorithms or things like this. And then there is you know, framing a problem in a, in a new way. And the, the, the problem is if you are a young, uh, young, young researcher doing a PhD is that if you want a job at the end of your PhD, you have to do things that may have an impact in a relatively short term, an intellectual impact, not necessarily a practical impact, but at least an intellectual impact. And doing the stuff that is like very ambitious, you cannot afford to do this because you have to finish your PhD in you know, five years if you're in North America, three years if you're in Europe. So, um, uh, so it's a it's a trade-off, right? So you go for things that might be a little easier and short-term because you know you need a job at the end, uh, you need publications in your in your resume, instead of the super ambitious stuff, which you know only people like us who have tenure and you know have won prizes can uh, can spend our time <laughs> can spend our time doing and try to convince others to work on it as well. Uh, so find a balance because a little bit of the ambitious makes life exciting. So let me, um, it's very possible that since we're talking remotely that I'm just a human-like avatar and there's an AI chatbot behind uh, that's generating the words I'm saying. Uh, that's an interesting Turing test question that we could talk about uh, later. But if you look at the um, future of a world where there's AI systems that achieve human level intelligence, what excites you about that world? What are the, is it the human a connection with chatbots and things like that, or is it very specific applications? What what is cool to you about this world? Uh, maybe Jan, you go first. I think it's the amplification of human intelligence. So the the um, the fact that you know every human could do more stuff, essentially, be more productive, more creative. Um, uh, perhaps uh, f spend their time on more fulfilling activities, uh, things like that, which is really the history of uh, technological evolution, right? So I think uh, that's that's the exciting uh, uh, part, in my opinion. And then, you know, of course, uh, th there's going to be kind of, you know, specific things that people will get interested in, like, you know, uh, virtual assistants, and they, they can talk to, they can answer any question and, and things like that. And um, uh, and when you have, you know, when you have a, a difficult uh, uh, intellectual challenge and problem, you won't be alone to solve it. You'll have, you know, AI systems to uh, help you with the, with that. So there's always the the fear, you know, that 
technology is going to make us stupid or or weak. But I don't believe in this at all. Like it's not like you know pocket calculators has made us bad at mathematics. On the contrary. Yeah, they made us better. Uh, Yosho, aside from making video games uh, better, uh, what do you think will be exciting about um, a world where we solve or begin to solve human level intelligence? Well, I agree very much with the picture Jan has drawn, but I will add some, some things. Um, that augmentation is going to help us become better at scientific discovery. So that's, there, that's where there's a positive feedback loop here, right? Um, we used to rely completely on human minds to understand, say, the outcome of experiments and then propose new experiments, make sense of the world. And now we're building those machine learning tools that essentially are uh, you know, growing towards that, that capability. Um, and that's going to accelerate the progress of science. Uh, and, and that can have profound positive impacts on, 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 on everyone. So for example, in healthcare, like understanding better how cells work, uh, how cancer works, right? Uh, how uh, viruses are able to get around our defenses. So this is very complex and it, it, it up to now it's been very slow in some sense to make sense of, of these hard questions, whether it's in biology or astrophysics or whatever, but we, we we are building up tools that I think will uh, change radically how we do science and how we discover treatments and, and, and everything like this. Yeah, and of course, you know, modeling uh, uh, complex, uh, complex behavior of complex systems, um, things like, you know, materials, um, you know, climate, climate, uh, uh, you know, energy storage and batteries and, uh, you know, production of uh, hydrogen to store energy, which would be a big, a big step towards uh, solving climate change issues, uh, controlling plasma infusion reactors, you know, I mean, so there's all kinds of, of things like this that have the potential to, you know, solve, uh, you know, big problems in the world. Uh, and they're all kind of collective phenomena that uh, sort of the, the classical reductionist uh, way of uh, analyzing uh, or modeling things doesn't quite work because they are complex collective phenomena. Um, so now we need what we need are kind of phenomenological models that we can, that cannot be contained uh, in our head, cannot be contained in a few formula on the paper, uh, and and have to be sort of basically uh, implemented by machines, which you know will allow us to make predictions, perhaps not understand to the same extent that we you know we can understand uh, simple physical phenomena, but um, but that that will help us a lot for uh, indeed for progress for science. I mean, this is an, this is another idea. The idea that, uh, you know, analyzing data using machine learning and sort of what we now call AI uh, will help with science, uh, you know, started emerging, you know, something like 15 years ago, certainly in, in, in uh, uh, genomics and things like this. And uh, I created a, a center for data science at NYU about 10 years ago for that per for that reason for that purpose and of course let me let me let me just uh, sure. like give an example to sure. uh maybe make a bit more concrete what what yana is is uh, talking about and also connect it with the earlier discussion about representation learning and self-supervised learning so think about what uh, physicists and chemists have done when they have invented abstractions like pressure and temperature these are not things that exist at the low level, you know, of the physics. Um, they are complete, like you know, inventions of our minds that happen to have really nice um, abstraction properties that you can describe phenomena at an abstract level using very few variables, and 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 predict things very reliably at least at the aggregate level. So this is the sort of thing that up to now only human minds could do. But, but I see that as learning the right abstractions uh, such that at that level of representation, things become easier uh, to uh, model. So the kinds of world models that Jan were talking about, was talking about, they need that kind of abstraction, that kind of structure that's going to be discovered by, by the learner so that suddenly things make sense. And it becomes much easier to explain lots of things when you introduce these high level abstractions. Absolutely, that's the yeah. you know, the underlying uh, engine of, of of intelligence is the construction of abstraction that allows you to make predictions. 
essentially. And perhaps engineering such artificial intelligence systems will help us understand our own uh, human mind uh, further, which has yes. been something that humans have dreamed and drove towards for for um, millennia. So uh, it is truly an honor, Jan and Yosho, to talk with you today. This is uh, something that AI systems of the future will look back at uh, with admiration. So thank you for your time today. This is awesome. Thanks to you. Thanks, Rex. Always a pleasure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Pan, and as a program manager, I help develop and grow our responsible AI team at Meta. So today, I'd like to talk to you about the work our responsible AI team does at scale across Meta, our ongoing commitment to issues like privacy, fairness, and transparency in AI, and how building responsibly now can help benefit Metaverse experiences of the future. Specifically, we'll go into more detail on our team charter and upcoming priorities. We'll share how we approach topics like AI fairness and transparency and control and contextualize REI through public projects. So let's start with who we are and why Meta formed the responsible AI team. Our REI team is a cross-disciplinary group within the Meta AI organization. We build and test approaches to really help ensure that our machine learning systems are designed and used responsibly. Our mission is to ensure that AI at Meta benefits people and society. Now, this requires deep collaboration, both internally and externally, across a diverse set of teams, including product and platform groups, policy and legal experts, support from across the highest levels of Meta leadership, and researchers who are really steeped in the larger REI community. We also develop our practices in regular consultation and collaboration with outside experts and regulators. And further, we partner with impacted communities, external experts in academic institutions, and industry stakeholders to understand the broader community's expectations when it comes to AI. Last summer, we published an AI blog post outlining our five pillars of REI, which include privacy and security, fairness and inclusion, robustness and safety, and transparency and control. The fifth pillar, governance and accountability, serves as a through line among them all. While some of our work is still in early stages and we have much to do, these five pillars guide our efforts to help ensure we build and use AI responsibly across the company. Now, I'd like to share more about how our team operates and the vision that helps guide our priorities and REI strategy. As mentioned, our mission is to ensure that AI at Meta benefits people and society. Our ultimate goal is to make responsible AI so ubiquitous that no one really mentions the term anymore. It's simply baked in as a part of the process. And until that time, we'll work cross-functionally with teams at all stages of product development, including new projects, in order to help them build responsibly right out of the gate. So what's ahead for our team this year? We'll focus on a couple of big bets, including helping to assess and assure the fairness of our AI systems across the company and reviewing our systems for robustness. But of course, we'll continue to support teams as needed across the whole spectrum of REI topics. Lastly, as we continue to build for the metaverse and explore AI's impact on immersive user experiences, we know the work we do now to build responsible experiences will transfer to the virtual world. So now I'd like to switch gears and dive deeper into our approach to AI fairness. Addressing fairness concerns often requires weighing difficult trade-offs, consulting with relevant subject matter experts, and hearing from people with lived experiences. We see fairness as a process that supports the creation of products and services that treat everyone equally and performs well for all users. So we're currently working to coordinate these efforts across the entire company that will help us 
to better define fairness goals for our products and services, continuously measure and remediate concerns, operationalize processes, track progress, and drive accountability, and finally, transparently communicate our efforts with internal and external audiences. It's a big task, but we're up to it, and there's more to come on this throughout the year. A good example and really a proof point of our AI fairness work this year was when our REI team collaborated with another internal team to release the Casual Conversations dataset. We built and released casual conversations in order to address the need for more high quality data sets designed to help evaluate potential algorithmic biases in complex real world AI systems. The data set consists of over 45,000 videos of paid participants having non scripted conversations. Participants disclosed their age and gender, which allowed this data set to be a relatively unbiased collection of Asian gender samples. Additionally, we were able to provide labels on skin tone and ambient lighting conditions. This data set is designed to help researchers evaluate their computer vision and audio models for accuracy across these dimensions. As an industry and research community, we really are at the beginning of understanding the technical and social challenges of defining assessing and mitigating fairness and algorithmic bias issues. But with this data set, we hope to unlock more fairness measurements and research and bring the field one step closer to building fairer, more inclusive technologies. Now I'd like to share more about how we're working to assess fairness in relation to race in the US and across our products and systems. Last fall, we announced our approach to race data measurement as a part of our commitment to building fair and inclusive products. As questions have been raised about technology's potential effects on members of marginalized communities, we've heard the calls for more research. And that's why, in collaboration with our civil rights team, we shared details on privacy-preserving approaches that we're currently scoping and piloting in the US. These methods gather and expand on practices that are already in the field and help us assess whether product outcomes and system responses differ across race and ethnicity. First, we researched and then used aggregate US census zip code data, which is an accepted way of measuring demographics in the US. However, this approach has some limitations, which we detail in our technical white paper published in November. To that end, we turned to Bayesian Improved Surnum Geocoding, or BizG. BizG leverages last name and zip code pairs from public US Census Bureau data to generate probability distributions. We then augmented this method with a series of privacy-preserving adaptations, and meta teams are beginning to pilot this method. Lastly, we identified a measurement method that enables people to choose to self-identify. Secure Multi-Party Computation, or SMPC, is still under development and will use innovative privacy-enhancing technologies to help us learn about potential differences in people's experiences in the US. In collaboration with partner institutions, we will conduct an opt-in, off-platform survey and run measurements while employing privacy-preserving methods. The technical white paper on the Meta AI website includes a lot more details on these methods, the best practices that they're built off of, and the privacy safeguards that we've incorporated. We're using these techniques with the purpose of ensuring user privacy in this sensitive area while supporting equitable experiences for our users. While this work will initially focus on race in the US, it will help us lay the groundwork for how we address concerns from other marginalized communities here and around the world. Now I'd like to discuss another important pillar of our RAI work, transparency and control. At Meta, we believe that people who use our products should have more transparency into how data about them is collected and used, which is why it's one of our eight core privacy expectations. We're exploring ways to share more about when and how AI systems operate. One of the ways we're testing this is through AI model documentation, a widely accepted practice within the AI community. Today, we're sharing the next step in this journey 
by publishing a prototype AI system card tool, which builds off of the model cards methods. These have the potential to provide insight into underlying AI system architecture and help better explain how the systems operate. This AI system card outlines the many components, the AI models that comprise an AI system and can help enable a better understanding of how these systems operate based on the individual's history, preferences, settings, and more. The pilot system card we've developed and will continue to test is for the Instagram feed ranking system. These cards can serve as an important step in the journey towards helping users, regulators, and experts to understand what transparency looks like at meta scale. And as the industry evolves and the discussions about model documentation and AI transparency continue, we'll continue to iterate on our approach. We consider our pilot as a living document that has the potential to be updated over time to reflect product changes, evolving industry standards, best practices in the research community, and expectations around AI transparency. Lastly, before we close, I'd like to share an example of important research coming from our REI team. Earlier, you heard about some of our work on automatic machine translation from Angela. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Stevie, who will speak about her recent research that she's done that examines natural language processing and fairness. Thanks, Jackie. Hi everyone, my name is Stevie Bergman and I'm a research scientist in Responsible AI at Meta. Moderation of content on Meta relies in large part on natural language processing systems that function on the global stage. These NLP systems learn from data that is labeled by people from the community for which they're reviewing the content. Of course, for these systems to be fair and responsible, at minimum, they need to be trained and validated on accurately labeled data but language can be tricky and complicated. An instructive and important example of this can be found when looking at the varieties of Arabic. Arabic is often thought of as one language. However, in reality, it is best considered a family of languages with over 30 dialects in more than 20 countries where it is the official or dominant language. And at Meta, we have over 140 million Arabic speaking users spread out all over the globe. To understand the responsibility and fairness of our Arabic systems, starting in March 2020 and through to 2021, Responsible AI undertook a deep study of labeling and processing of Arabic content on our platforms, working closely with global experts in the varieties of Arabic and nations where Arabic is spoken, and paying close attention to the sociolinguistic properties of the Arabic varieties. From this work, we not only learned possible avenues to improve our Arabic systems, and in fact are now making those improvements, but have developed a sociolinguistically motivated responsible AI methodology that we are testing as part of our cross-company effort to advance fairness. And now, passing it back to Jackie. Thanks, Stevie. And thank you all for your time today. We look forward to continuing to build responsible AI alongside you. Next up, Irina Kaufman will share our approach to building a strong environment for AI research and innovation. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Irina Kaufman. I'm a director and business lead at MetaAI. Today, I wanted to share a glimpse of what it takes to establish and maintain an AI lab where innovation can happen and an AI team can thrive. I'm lucky enough to have an opportunity and responsibility to help enable that. As we step inside the lab and what it entails to provide a good environment, it's important to acknowledge it can be a challenge and requires an investment and commitment. I want to be real with all of you about some of the challenges we encounter. This includes figuring out how to work in a big company, but maintain research freedom and exploration. We have to consider how to evaluate success. It won't always look like product launches, and that's okay. Processes can slow things down, so we need to stay nimble and maintain the ability to move fast. We may require things that are a bit different from many other groups, such as speaking openly about research and publishing work with many collaborators externally and setting open-ended goals on longer horizons. Here at MetaAI, 
The way we see innovation and progress in AI happening is through the support of open science, collaborations, investment in people, and research integrity. I've worked at various tech companies, both on core products as well as AI, over the last 15 years. At first, I didn't really comprehend how important the environment was. And to be honest, tried to implement typical processes that worked wonders on other teams. What I saw work is a heavy investment in research, enabling teams to explore things others may not yet be ready to, and providing the space and resources to do so. People are the crux of everything we do. To build for the world, we need to make sure we're considering the global audience. This means also working across the world. Both through our employees and collaborators, we have a global footprint that continues to expand. As an organization and company, we have embraced remote work, enabling employees to work from locations more broadly and outside our offices. So in addition to a global footprint of office locations, we have employees and academic collaborators around the globe. While we come from all over the world, we also bring a variety of experiences and areas of expertise. Our teams are made up of many functions that work alongside researchers and engineers. And together we enable greater progress and collaboration. We take a cross-functional approach to support each other and provide space for everyone to focus on what they do best. Researchers and engineers work with design, user research, product and program management, and analytics to explore problem spaces and deliver experiences. These functions bring a unique set of skills and complement each other to enable teams to move faster and provide more impact. There is no one size fits all when it comes to AI innovation. Researchers and engineers need space to explore. There are opportunities to work on an entire spectrum of outcomes. These range from research to core platform work to AI for products. We support and encourage investment into projects that may have no clear link to meta products and have done this consistently. One of the similarities across much of our work is the importance of open science. Our organization was founded on the principle of advancing the state of the art in AI through open collaboration with the community. We do this by publishing our work for all to see, sharing code publicly, investing in academia, and interacting constantly with others in the field. To drive innovation in AI, bright and diverse minds across the field must exchange ideas with each other. Progress is cumulative and will be made by being transparent about research successes and pitfalls, recreating and reproducing the work, and most importantly, improving it. Without this model of open and reproducible science, we can't hold each other accountable and accessibility to technology is significantly reduced. We care about advancing the science, not owning the science. By open sourcing, we move away from focusing on who owns what and can instead enable the whole community and diverse minds to work on important problems, give researchers more tools to tackle remaining challenges and enable reproducibility and scientific rigor. Openness cannot be an afterthought. And that's why we often share research with code, even in its early stages. We believe the community should not solve things and then share the results. Data sets should be released once a problem is identified so we can all tackle the problem together. An example of our commitment to open science is through our collaboration with NYU's Langone School of Medicine on a project called Fast MRI where we leverage AI to create MRIs from much less data, enabling faster MRI scans. Our collaborators at NYU released the largest publicly available data set of raw MRI measurements. And we partnered with them to release open source tools and baseline results to empower the larger AI and medical imaging research communities to help tackle this problem. We expect future clinical studies to show our accelerated scans can also enable new use cases, and major scanning machine vendors are testing our code and have applied for FDA approval to bring it into production. A true commitment to advancing research in open science cannot be done without careful consideration of how and when we put data out there. It must be done responsibly. 
We strive to raise the bar on data set creation, something that is meaningful to the research community at large and pushes the entire field forward. As we build and release data sets, we do so with key fundamentals in mind, including having privacy and fairness as guiding principles. We carefully consider licensing to enable users to have as much access and rights as we do. This can mean that we need to take additional steps to create the data set. At times, this has meant needing additional funding and time to build appropriately and put in place terms to enable further research by those using the open source data. One example of this is the deepfake data set Meta AI released in late 2019. We built this data set with a wide variety of high quality videos featuring more than 3,500 different paid actors, each of whom agreed to participate in the project. This human-centered approach enabled us to work with the community, accelerate progress, and ultimately help prevent people from being deceived by the images and videos they see online. We often partner with academics, industry, and civil society organizations when building and deploying data sets. This enables us to integrate different points of view and through challenges open to researchers and the public, allows the broader community to tackle problems together. Some examples of these challenges over the past few years have been to detect deep fakes, explore multimodal understanding through the hateful memes challenge, and detect image manipulation through the image similarity challenge. Data sets and openness will play a critical role as we build for the metaverse. Immersive experiences in the metaverse should be inclusive and built to understand a variety of people and things and make you feel like you're right there interacting with others. Two examples of existing work that has the potential to impact this virtual world is our casual conversation data set, which can help researchers evaluate the fairness of their computer vision and audio models, and our egocentric 4D perception research, which advances work into building smarter, more flexible computer vision systems to teach AI to perceive the world through your eyes. As we develop research, it's important to share it properly with the world. We are committed to open research and to critical independent publications from our researchers. With our publication review process, we abide by several principles, including not censoring work and being transparent of the checks we do and commitment to working towards publication. We continue to adapt our processes as we know they're not perfect and listen to our researchers as well as cross-functional partners to streamline reviews as best we can. We have a history of publishing work that analyzes our own AI systems because it helps us improve those systems. Our publication review seeks to ensure we respect policies and to prevent the work from being misconstrued, not to censor inconvenient truths. For example, we published results suggesting that our X-ray image recognition service does not work as well for users in non-Western countries. And this spurred a large effort to make all our computer vision products more responsible. And another example is the research Stevie shared today on how we're working to better understand the responsibility and fairness of our Arabic systems. Our ability and support for collaborating with others extends to academia. And much of our work and progress today would not have been possible without the strong partnership with academics. No one company or luminary has the monopoly on good ideas and progress won't be made by experimenting behind closed doors. That's why we at Meta AI collaborate with academics on nearly everything we do, from publishing papers to funding labs, to offering research awards, to having a flexible dual affiliation model for researchers. This collaboration moves the field faster today and supports its future by improving the field's diversity and opening opportunities for students. We run an assortment of programs, including internships, an AI residency program, as well as co-advising programs with the universities globally, including Oxford, Carnegie Mellon University, and UC Berkeley, to name a few. One of these programs, which we began in 2020, is the co-teaching program with Georgia Tech to increase pathways in AI. Together with faculty at Georgia Tech, 
Med AI researchers both developed the curriculum for and guest lectured in a deep learning course as part of the university's online Masters of Science in Computer Science program. The goal was to help students experience real world examples and learn valuable techniques used in deploying and scaling algorithms. The original plan was to teach the course on campus in Atlanta, but due to the pandemic, all course instruction was moved to a virtual model after only three in-person classes. In the end, more than 1,600 students took the course in the first year, with nearly 2,400 completing it to date. Of that cohort, 85% of students surveyed indicated they feel better prepared for jobs in AI. Today, we're introducing the expansion of this effort and the AI Learning Alliance an initiative to strengthen diversity and increase equity in the field of artificial intelligence. Our shared goal is to have more people from underrepresented groups trained in the technology of artificial intelligence, which is why the course is now available for free online to anyone to take, student, professional, and hobbyist alike. Through our online learning platform, Meta Blueprint, we're poised to teach thousands more by opening it up to everyone. In addition to making the course content from the co-teaching program available and free to all, we're working with professors at historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, and Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions, and our newly established consortium to further develop and teach the curriculum. These universities will also be coming together to contribute additional cutting edge AI education lectures and resources for all to use. We're only getting started and MedAI is only as successful as the people who make up this lab, both internally and externally. We need to continue to invest in talent and provide an environment that removes barriers to getting things done and embraces the spirit of research and open science. Over the next year, our AI teams are growing tremendously, adding hundreds of employees worldwide and more collaborations. As this happens, it will be imperative to learn from these individuals and continue to develop a space where they can thrive. As I pass on to Mark and Jerome, I wanna thank them for their continued support of our AI environment and growing team. All right, thanks, Arena. To wrap things up, I wanna welcome back Jerome so we can talk a bit about how we're approaching this work at Meta and the opportunities in our teams. There are four basic pillars of our work on AI. First, there is foundational research, which is where teams can do original and unbounded research to advance the state of the art. This is where we're looking to further understand and push the whole field forward. It's completely open. Our researchers can work on whatever they want, and we publish a lot of our work so that way anyone can access it. Second, there's the AI for product team which is about taking what we've learned and building it into products at scale. Third, responsible AI, which focuses on the implications of technology and what it means to build responsibly and is home to our teams who work on fairness and privacy preserving AI. And fourth, AI infrastructure, which covers everything from our AI platform to our compute efforts to PyTorch, uh, the leading open source machine learning framework that we developed and which is used in tens of thousands of projects around the world. Now, in each of these areas, we have some pretty ambitious hiring goals. So, Jerome, uh, do you want to say more about the kind of opportunities that are open to folks who want to work at Meta AI? Thanks, Mark. We have opportunities everywhere in North America and in Europe for research scientists, software engineers, data scientists, designers, user researchers, program managers. We have opportunities at all levels of organization, inventing new algorithms to improve the experience for billions of our users, developing new best practices in responsible AI, or creating with AI completely new experiences for the metaverse in augmented or virtual reality. And speaking of opportunities, we are pretty excited about our future technology roadmap here too. And if you're focused on the space, you probably saw that last month we announced uh, we've designed and built our first supercomputer. And we think it's going to be one of the fastest supercomputers in the world with almost five exaflops or five billion billion operations per second. You know, it's, a, it's a beast. And Jerome, can, can you tell everyone here 
uh, what kinds of tasks we're going to be putting uh, this supercomputer to work on? Well, we're really, really excited about this one, Mark. Uh, we want to give AI researchers and developers the best environment possible so that they can come up with unique breakthroughs in AI and build awesome products uh, powered by AI. So this AI supercomputer is a major step forward in this regard with 16,000 GPUs that by the end of this year, you'll be able to use to train a single model. It will enable us to push the state of the art in scaling AI, keep making progress in self-supervised learning, and advance our efforts to create a unified world model that, as we have shown today, will unlock the metaverse. All right. So thanks very much for, for tuning in today, everyone. I, I hope you enjoyed this look inside the lab. And if you're interested in pushing the state of the art in AI, and whether that's building the next generation of assistants for the metaverse or creating the universal language translator, I hope that you'll consider joining us on this journey and be part of building the future.